Today, as we come to the table, your wife or husband doesn't love you anymore. This new one will make you happy. God will forgive you. Whatever the enemy throws into our mind to tempt us in that. And you can go any one of these sins you can name. I just grabbed the first one that's here. But it's not, it's not a, that's not a, a demon that's making you do that. There may be that pull and tug by the demonic realm. But what Paul is saying is all of these things he's, he lists here, he says, these are things of the flesh that unless you're walking in the spirit, you're going to be apt to do. And I'm not saying that means that just because you're not walking in the spirit, you're going to commit adultery. I think there's different levels of, of, of decisions and choices and, and things that happen. But the bottom line is you're going to be influenced toward these things of the flesh if you're not walking in the spirit. There's been a tendency among parts of the church to blame personal sin on forces outside of our control. Some point to chemical or psychological imbalances. Others point to demons as forcing them into actions and attitudes they don't want. While there are sometimes psychological issues at play, in general, sin is a personal choice, and the responsibility for it lies squarely on our shoulders. Well, thanks for staying with us today as we come to the table, the daily Bible study program of Pastor Mark Kirk of Calvary Knoxville. Pastor Mark will explain in today's message that resisting sin starts in your heart. If you determine to faithfully serve God, who saved you by grace, He will equip you. It's not that you'll never fall, but it shouldn't be a routine part of life. Now, let's join Pastor Mark in the book of Galatians chapter 5 as he continues his message, The Daily Choice, The Daily Battle. We blame everything on the devil. Let's remember something. We have an enemy that's causing us and and tempting us and pulling us in the wrong direction. But the Bible says we have a sin nature without him that's doing the same thing. If if Satan was non-existent, we would still have a desire to do wrong. So we have two battles we have to face, our own flesh and the enemy. And we're not powerful enough to, to fight that. Only God can fight that. That comes by prayer and by the Spirit of God. And so this is what he's getting across to them. And look at verse 18. He says, but... If you're led by the Spirit, you're not under the law. Again, he's been referring to the law throughout Galatians, as you guys know, whether to live under the law, not to live under the law, not put yourself under the law. And he says each day, really, depending on whether we're being led by the flesh or the Spirit, will determine whether the law is necessary in our life or not. That is, if we're walking in the Spirit, the law is not needed because we're doing what's right. But if we're walking in the flesh or our natural sinful sinful desires, the law is necessary in order to keep us in line. You know, I mean, again, it's just easy one to use it over and over. But I mean, if you're doing the speed limit, you don't, you don't need the law there to, to regulate you. You're doing it. It's when we're not doing the speed limit that the law is that regulator or whatever the law is that regulates us. And his point is, if we're walking in the spirit, the law is not necessary. But when we're walking in the flesh, the law has to be there to keep us and mankind uh, in line. First Timothy 1, 9 through 10 says this. Knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous person, but for the lawless and the insubordinate, for the ungodly and for the sinners, for the unholy and profane, for murderers of fathers and murderers of mothers, for manslayers, for fornicators, for sodomites, for kidnappers, for liars, for perjurers, And if there's any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine. So the law is designed to stop these things. But if you're walking in the spirit, it's not necessary. So Paul Paul lays the groundwork there. And then he begins to point out what the laws or what the works of the flesh are. Now we're going to know these all too well because we've experienced many of them, uh, if not most. Notice what he says. He says, verse 19, the works of the flesh are evident. I love that word there because what it means is, is we all know it. We recognize the works of the flesh. He goes, this is not something that's going to surprise us. And what are they? He says, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like, of which I tell you beforehand, just as I also told you in time past, 
that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Now, we'll come back to 21 and explain what that means. But Paul gives a list here now of the flesh and things that are evident, that are clearly seen. And again, when we read the list, you probably noticed some of the things that people blame on, on demons and or even diseases. And yet Paul says, these aren't, these aren't demons and these aren't diseases. These are what? Works of the flesh. The Bible makes it very clear what they are. They're works of the flesh. And, and, and again, a lot of people, I think, try to blame these on demons because they want to say that somebody else is making them do it and pass the buck. You know, I'm, I've got the, the demon of adultery. And that's why I love it. Listen, there is no demon of adultery. There's the sin of adultery. And if we commit the sin of adultery, no doubt there are demons influencing that. No doubt there are demons saying, go for it. You know, your wife or husband doesn't love you anymore. This new one will make you happy. God will forgive you. Whatever the enemy throws into our minds to tempt us in that. And you can go any one of these sins you can name. I just grabbed the first one that's here. But it's not, it's not a, that's not a, a demon that's making you do that. There may be that pull and tug by the demonic realm. But what Paul is saying is all of these things he's, he lists here, he says, these are things of the flesh that unless you're walking in the spirit, you're going to be apt to do. And I'm not saying that means that just because you're not walking in the spirit, you're going to commit adultery. I think there's different levels of, of, of decisions and choices and, and things that happen. But the bottom line is you're going to be influenced toward these things of the flesh if you're not walking in the spirit. And so we'll get to where what Paul says the ultimate outcome is and explain that uh, when we get there. Um, but look at this list again here of, of the fleshly life. Number one, adultery. What is adultery? Well, it's sexual relations with anyone other than your spouse. And Jesus said, even in thought life. And if, if we weren't convicted of the first part, we're convicted of the second. And it doesn't have to be sexual. Typically for men, it's sexual. For women, it might be romantic. It might be, I want somebody that loves me. It might be, you know, the you know, this, the 24-hour, every day, every channel hallmark, hallmark has started now for the holidays. How come my husband doesn't have a beautiful house with a nice Christmas tree and diamonds everywhere and some romantic skating thing? If I skated, I'd fall down and the ring would go flying, you know, so that wouldn't work. But it's this whole romance thing, right? There's nothing wrong in that. But it's these kind of things that can draw people in, whether it's a novel or whether it's a movie. That's where women, I think, are more susceptible. So women, be careful. Guard yourself. Satan presents things much differently than they are. And then for men, it's oftentimes, again, the sexual because of the way we're made, you know. She's younger. She's prettier. This one, will, you know, whatever. She'll love you. Your wife, to, whatever. You're, you're being lied to. And, and, and anything for temporary, anything can be a temporary fling or seem like something new and exciting, but you know what that's like? You get something new, you're so excited. After a while, it's back to the same just like it was before. Your new car, I got a new car. A year or two, it's the best thing in the world. And it gets that first scratch. You know, I watch guys leave their wives and marry the new model or whatever, so to speak, no pun intended, and then the first scratch comes along, and now they're divorcing that one, and then to the next one, buy a new one, you know. The flesh is never satisfied, and so adultery is something, again, here that, you know, Paul warns against and says, you know, Jesus warned you in thought life, guard yourself. Fornication, this is interesting, another work of the flesh, any sexual relationship outside of marriage, Okay, and note this, and it includes any sexual acts outside of marriage. There's a whole mindset today that people think, well, I'm, I'm not really having physical relations, you know, completely with someone. If you're doing anything sexual with someone that's not, you're, you're not married to, it's, it's what the Bible refers to as fornication. It's sin before God. What about uncleanness? We got quiet on those last two, didn't it? By, by the way, this is why we don't have kids in here. We talk about adult subjects, and we teach our kids at their level. We teach the adults at the adult level. But we're going to talk straight up and honest what the Bible talks about because we have to do that to know how, what we're facing and what to battle. What's the next thing? Uncleanness. It means moral impurity based on God's word. So what God says is immoral is immoral. So uncleanness, if you're, if you're doing something that God says is not moral, that's what he's talking about. Lewdness. This is an interesting word here. It means perverted sexual activity. I can let you fill the blanks in on that one. But it also relates to public displays of lewd things that one should be ashamed of. You know, I look at our culture today, and many people are doing things out in the open and out in public that they should be ashamed to be doing, even in private. And yet they bring it to the public arena, and what happens today? Much of our culture praises them. Wow, how bold you are. God says it's lewdness. It's going to keep you from the kingdom of God. What's another one? Idolatry. This, that's anything we put before God. You know, idolatry just means the most important thing in your life. Whatever, that can be anything. Whatever it might be, fill in the blank. 
This one's interesting. Look at the next one. Sorcery. It's the word pharmakia. Does that ring a bell for anybody? Yeah. Before we get the word pharmacy, pharmaceuticals, what Paul is saying is drug abuse. He's saying drug abuse is sin against God. And people that live in drug abuse, if you will, as, as well as these other things, he says they'll not inherit the kingdom of God. It's interesting. Why You say, well, if it's drug abuse, why does he use the word sorcery here? The word sorcery because drugs are related to the demonic realm. Drugs are often a door to the demonic realm. If you get involved in drug activity, it opens up a door to the demonic realm to have greater influence in your life. And so there's a connection there with sorcery and pharmacia. And I hear people say, well, you know what? It's natural, man. It's, a, it's an herb. You know, it grows in the ground or whatever the case might be, especially with marijuana being legalized now in many places. There's a lot of people that are tempted to say, you know what? No big deal. Just kind of go with the flow and don't worry about it. Listen, guys, a lot of things are natural. Hemlock's natural. But it will kill you. And that God, God warns about this. Be careful about this. And this is where the believer has to go. You know what? Just because the, a society says it's okay or says it's legal doesn't mean it's, it's okay for us. What's the next one? Hatred. That's pretty self-explanatory. We're to love one another, not hate one another. Contentions, being argumentative. Um, jealousies. This is upset that they have something you don't. Again, um, there's a lot of jealousy in our, in our culture today. There's a lot, I think a lot of the, um, um, you know, this desire to... Uh, oh, you know, again, look, everybody should pay their fair share. I get that. When you talk about the whole issues of taxing and all that, but there's a big political issue, you know, tax the rich more and more and more and do this, whatever. A lot of that is motivated because why do they have it and I don't? You know, what's the motivation for that? You know, I, when I look at people that have inherited a lot of money, their parents inherited it, they, they invented something, created something, their family earned it, whatever, that should be something it's like, you know what, God bless them. God bless them. You know, I wish it'd been cool if my parents had done something like that, but they didn't. So, I don't have that. But you know what? Why, why do I want to attack those that do? If God's blessed you financially, God bless you. Praise the Lord. I'm happy for you. Well, Mark, how can you be so happy? You don't have all those things that, well, first of all, we live in America. We're all very blessed, are we not? And secondly, do you realize what's waiting for you guys? Do you realize what I have waiting for me? The kingdom. I think we can wait a little bit longer. Everyone in here is going to have more than you ever dreamed or imagined one day. And that's not, that's not the goal. That shouldn't be the goal, but you are. You, you're a king in a kingdom. You're going to be extremely wealthy. It's not some fairy tale. It's not a Hallmark movie. This is real. And so you don't have to let jealousy come in and take your heart over. We should you know, praise the Lord for them. Outbursts of wrath. That's lack of self-control. Again, we've, we've experienced these things. Look, the next one, selfish ambition. That is the me first attitude. I get to be the one that goes first. Dissensions, it means division, you know, d d dividing between each other. Heresies, you know, false teachings and things like that. Envy, why am I not the one that's the important one? How come everyone else gets to be the important one, you know? Murders, again, that can go even to the thought life. We talked about that. Here's one. And again, some of these are, are real hot button issues. You touch on them, but again, as, as believers and with the word of God, we have to be honest and straight up about this. Drunkenness. It doesn't say drinking, it says drunkenness. Note that. Drunkenness, it says, is a sin. All of these, by the way, it says are sins that will keep us from heaven. We'll explain that more in detail. I'll give that balance in just a moment. It's not talking about a one-time stumble. It's talking about a lifestyle. We'll, we'll get to more detail about that. But drunkenness. What does our society call drunkenness today? It's called a disease. Guys, it, it can't be a disease. There may be a stronghold against in your life. It may change you chemically if you do it long enough, but it can't be a disease. Here's why. God doesn't condemn people for diseases. God condemns or a person is self-condemned because of sin. And God says drunkenness is a sin. And I think this is where the confusion comes in. If you get involved in the sin of drunkenness like I used to be many years ago, then what happens is there are chemical changes in your body and there's a stronghold that comes into your life. I had some of that happen to me and it wasn't until Jesus set me free from that. But I realized when God showed it to me and when I gave my life to him, this is not something, yes, it's, it's a stronghold in my life, but it's not a disease, it's a sin. And I'll tell you, if there's any disease that you can just stop doing and you're healed, praise the Lord for that. Because I don't know of any. But when it comes to this one, if you repent and God's power sets you free, you're healed. It's a done deal. 
You know, I, I want to encourage some of you. I don't know where your different battles are and where you're coming from your background. I know that it's my understanding. I've not seen the paperwork, but if I ever ran for office, probably everybody would. I always think these guys that run for office, tell everybody you've ever done wrong right off the bat. Think about it. How do you defuse the enemy? Honesty and transparency. Probably, and I hadn't seen the paperwork, I think I'm registered as an alcoholic with the state of Tennessee. As you know, they put me down as an alcoholic. I had this many classes and this, whatever I had to do. And those of you who don't know my testimony, I'm not going to go into it. But for years, I was involved in that. But the term alcoholic means something that you can't be free from, does it not? I've had no desire for anything to drink for 30 years now. I'm not an alcoholic. I was in sin. And I repented. I'm now free in Christ. Now, this is not uncompassionate. I'm not being incompassionate if some of you are struggling in this area secretly. It's not lack of compassion. It's, it's straightforward love and being honest with you. This is not a disease. Don't try to give an excuse to it in the back of your heart and mind. You need to face it with God and say, God, here's the truth about me. I need you to heal me. I need you to set me free. And whatever needs to be done for me to be free, and if you need to go to some kind of uh, you know, support group to whatever, I'm saying whatever you need to be free, the point is, is you can't blame it on a disease because God says here it condemns men's souls from heaven. And God's not going to use a disease to keep someone from heaven. And lastly, he says revelries and the like. Very interesting. It's overall reckless, sinful behavior in life in general is really the definition. They had the God of Bacchus. Speaking of drinking, they had the God of Bacchus back then. Bacchus was the God of drinking. And they would all drink together, you know, and get drunk in the name of this God and walk in the streets and be loud and make noise. Basically, a drunken party in the streets is what they would do. And Paul says this, this as well will keep you from the kingdom of God. Because notice what he says here at the end of verse 21. He says uh, that those who practice, and I have that word underlined. He says those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Now, balance. Let's have balance right now. Is everybody ready? It doesn't mean if you've ever done one of these. It doesn't mean if you're struggling in any of these right now that you're not going to go to heaven. What it means is if you don't eventually repent, he's not talking about the weakness of the flesh, a battle you're having, a struggle, the flesh and the spirit like they're in the picture. He's not talking about it. He's saying if you, it means when it says practice, it means as a lifestyle long term. Okay, the difference is Man, I, you know, I've been struggling with alcohol, and it's, I just I, I can't believe it. I had too much the other night, and I got drunk. That's not good. That's sin. You need to ask God to forgive you. But that's not what he's talking about. If that's something that happens, and you go on with life, and it doesn't happen again, he's talking about on a regular basis, this week, and next week, and next week, and you're living that life that way. Yeah, but it's only once a week that I'm... Here's what he's saying. If you live that lifestyle as a normal lifestyle, he says, you're not going to inherit the kingdom of God. Now, I can't change God's word, and I dare not. My job is simply to proclaim it to you. He wrote it. I'm the proclaimer. Now, you've got to go to the Lord, and you've got to pray that out with him and your spirit, whatever that might be. And, and this goes to any of these things listed in here. But understand, it's, it's not something where you go, oh, no, I've had outbursts of wrath this week, and I got jealous this week, and I've had ambitions and dissensions, and, and I, you know, whatever, I, I got really mad at somebody, just yelled at him, you know, and my thought is, I wish I could kill that guy. That doesn't mean you're condemned, all right? It means all right, there's, there's a work of the flesh. Now get it right with God. But if you live your life in this way, on a regular basis, doing this, he's saying, if you do that, you can't inherit the kingdom of God. So heavy duty, and again, it should be taken seriously. But now notice he switches gears. There is what happens with the works of the flesh. Now he switches over in verse 22. Notice this. He says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. Now notice the things of the flesh are connected to works, while the things of the Spirit are called fruit. He connects them to fruit here, showing that works um, are connected to our efforts, but fruit happens on its own as we walk with God in the Spirit of God. And again, secondly, you'll notice the works of the flesh originate from man while the things of the Spirit originate from God. It's interesting that while the word fruit can be used plural in the English, here it's singular. So it means all these things are somehow tied together. And like fruit, as we walk in the Spirit, they'll just start happening without even, even trying. Isn't that encouraging? Here's what it means. If you daily walk in the Spirit, you'll start exhibiting these things we just read. 
You begin to, they'll just begin to naturally start happening. Why? Because it's fruit. It's not something you're working to do. It's something that naturally grows. You know, you don't have to, a tree doesn't have to strain to grow fruit. It just is planted where it needs to be planted and it grows fruit. When you're planted where you need to be planted in the things of the Lord, you'll naturally grow that fruit. And so the contrast of the fruit and the spirit. Um, notice here what they are. And I'll go through these quickly because I don't want to, I don't want to rush them, but I also don't want to stop right here. Uh, notice what he says here. Here's the fruit of the Spirit. Number one, love. Again, it's the word agape. 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 It's, it's the word love here, guys. It means a selfless love. It means that I'm going to love you guys more than myself. I fail so often in that. I want to love you guys more than I love me, but I love me pretty good. I'm just being honest. I'm being honest. I mean, if, if that space is open and I'm there before you and we both want it, And then when I do it, I'm like, ah, you know, I hope they don't know me. <laughs> Seriously, as a pastor, you do this stuff. Like, oh, hi, Pastor Mark. Hello. <clears throat> Hello. But and we all, we don't always love each other selfless, but that's what that word means. It's, it's praying, God, please let that. And here's the thing. I don't have to try for this now. This is a fruit. It's a, it should be something that naturally happens as we walk in the spirit. What happens we just begin to love each other more than we love ourselves. It's something only God can do that. You tell me that's not supernatural. We know that it is, don't we? It is supernatural. It's not connected to other feelings of love. There's, all the, there's the sexual love, and there's, the, there's all kinds of different words that are used in the Greek for love. This one is that selfless love that we need there. The next one, again, joy. It's a constant inner glow and peace apart from happiness. You know, people can take your happiness, but they can't take your joy if you're walking in the Spirit. Peace, the next one, rest, is it's rest in your heart. You know that everything's right with God. Long-suffering, it's patience, the ability to wait on God. That's a beautiful fruit to grow in the believer's life. Just being able to wait on God and say, all right, God, I, 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 I can wait on you. I can do this. You know, I, used to, I couldn't do that early on. I, I don't know, probably none of us can. I'm getting better at doing it now and just trusting him. Look at the next one, kindness, another fruit that grows naturally. These, again, these are natural things that grow, doing good things for others. And then goodness falls right in that, doing good for others and God. Again, just that love that comes out, it happens. Faithfulness, we become dependable. Somebody can trust us. They know we're trustworthy. Gentleness and an ability to show self-control toward others and even in our own life. You know, gentleness. I, 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 I had the other day, I was standing somewhere and there was a bunch of crowded people crowd of people or whatever, this kind of thing. And it's one of those times where you're kind of prayed up, you're in the Lord, you're having a kind of a good day and you're filled with, and then somebody comes by, this lady comes by and she's like, bam, kind of pushed me out of the way. And we're in this big crowded area and it's a restaurant area or whatever, just kind of doesn't even look, just knocks me out of the way and keeps going or whatever. And didn't even, it's like, what? didn't bother me. You know, now that's, again, this is not normal stuff. I'm just saying when you're, you know, if you're, if you're, where you, you're walking in the spirit at the moment. So I don't want to present a picture of me that's not true. But I was, I was, I was doing okay. She kind of, boom, I kind of smiled about it. No big deal. Somebody came up to me. I saw that lady be extremely rude to you. I can't believe the way you responded. You just kept smiling and didn't. I was like, that was fruit. I wasn't trying to do that. Now, if you'd have seen me maybe last week, I'd, hey, lady, and I don't know, right? So I don't want to give you a wrong picture about me. I'm not trying to present Mr., you know, float from place to place Mr. Halo up here. But when you are in the spirit, you have patience, you have gentleness. So what, somebody knocked you out of the way, big deal. Is your life gonna end? It's not, you're gonna be okay. And you might be a witness and not even know it. And just like that, another time at the table of God's word has come to an end. Pastor Mark will continue teaching through the book of Galatians, but you don't have to wait until then to listen to more great Bible studies. You can access this series plus much more at thewaymedia.net. Feel free to share these messages with anyone who wants to know more about what the Bible has to say. The book of Galatians touches on faith and works while helping to bring a balanced perspective on the very real struggle between the two. Consider this a friendly reminder not to force your faith, just to prove you're doing the right thing. Simply accept God's grace, and through His kindness, your works will be rightly motivated. Say, do you live in the Knoxville area? If so, we invite you to join Pastor Mark and the staff at Calvary Knoxville for our next service. For over 20 years, it's been incredible to see how God has used us in our local community and through this radio outreach. There's always a seat for you, Sunday mornings at 8, 9.30, or 11.15, Sunday night at 6, or Wednesday night at 7. Can't make it in person? 
No worries, you can join us online. We stream our services through the Way Media app that you can download from your app store or right from the waymedia.net. You can scroll to the bottom of the waymedia.net for a link to our church info too. Pastor Mark has much more to share from the book of Galatians, so we hope you can join us the next time we come to the table. Come to the Table is a radio outreach ministry of Calvary Knoxville.